Just wanted to welcome everyone to this month's Mother of All Demo Days meeting. Today we have three awesome demos from IP Stewards, Lotus, and DRAND. Um, just if you don't know what Mother of All Demo Days is, um, once every month the Starfleet teams get together to share progress in their projects in the format of a demo. Um, hence Mother of All Demo Days. Let's get it started with uh, Jarapo from IP Stewards. So I'm going to present to you Repi, which is a new experimental download client. And the goal is to optimize for throughput. So the main problem right now is that we use BitSwap, where a Go BitSwap plane, which uh, works. However, it's not very fast. Um, I have quite fast internet, and it's downloading at three megabytes per second. And just so you know, the file I will be testing with is this.ipfs.io because uh, it's a pretty big folder, fifty gigabyte, and it has lots and lots of people that download IPFS themselves. So it should download very fast because there are many peers in the network that have the file. And yes, it's downloading very slowly. So I'll show you the demo of the program route. So it's not downloading very fast right now. So um, it's only 75 megabytes per second. Because right now, uh, Happy, so my new client, is using gateways for uh, the backend. And the gateway are a bit overloaded right now. So uh, I'm so that means that the speed right now, which is already well, pretty time faster than GoBitSwap, is actually limited by the file use gateway I'm using. And so the main way that Happy is uh, achieving the speed is by multiplying the transfers. So instead of downloading blocks one by one or 32 by 32, uh, Happy is going to divide the graph in multiple parts in a tree following the links between the various blocks. So all the blocks in the middle. So except uh, X, Y, and Z, or block in the graph we want to download. And then you have a, an algorithm that will report uh, partition nodes and gives them tasks on various parts of the network. Uh, I won't go there in detail about how the algorithm works. If you want to know, uh, I've made a presentation of it that moves the bytes working group. So you can find the link right here. Uh, the expected performance, it's very good, uh, I would say. The for the throughput. Uh, it's just basically you take the sum of all the peers you have, and unless in edge cases where the graph you have more peers than uh, blocks in the graph that are able to be downloaded, you you should expect just the sum of all the throughput, and that's well, one of the main reasons how I can reach uh, 2.5 gigabit per second, which is the limit of my fiber, that uh, it will uh, download from many many peers in parallel, and the time to first byte it's. Because at the start, we don't have any peers. Like We only know one block. Uh, so what, what Rocky does is that it will download from many, it will download the same block from everyone because it has nothing better to do. So the time to first byte is a minimum from all the downloaders, which is uh, still quite good. It's not incredible, but it's still quite good if you have multiple gateways and uh, they can load values. Um, the efficiency, the CPU usage, uh, around 100 nanosecond to 500 nanosecond per block which is just counting rapid. It's not counting the protocol behind, uh, which is extremely good. In theory, you should be able to do 45 uh, terabit, uh, TB byte per second. Obviously, you don't do that. It's just uh, basically rapid is like so fast that all you care about optimizing is your actual underlying data transfer. The memory usage is uh, depends. The bigger your graph, the more memory it uses because we need to keep the tree. And the network efficiency is still rather good. Uh, the wider the graph is, the better, because we don't have those cases where you have two people downloading the same block as much. Um, the, right now, Rapid only works on gateway using the car response. And the goal is to make it support more protocols. So I have uh, not worked on this yet. But basically, we need a more uh, slightly more complex logic that keep track of the list of work, because we have uh, this logic of the metric, which is how many people are attempting to download some part of the graph. But I will work on this uh, in the near future. And graph sync uh, would be very easy to add because you can reuse the same logic for the car gateway. Because uh, graph sync and gateway, uh, car over gateway is pretty close protocol. They are both, uh, I call them server driven. That means that I ask for some request, and the server is sending me a bunch of uh, blocks without having me to keep asking for more and more. So I can start a request somewhere and then stop it when I'm unhappy. Um, the main reason right now it's not shipping in Kubo is because it lacks critical features. Uh, content routing, currently I just have a hard-coded list of gateways I'm using. We'll need to use a DHT and IPNI. 
Now, having BitSwap support, this is very important for Kubo because all the content we download today is in BitSwap. And a small, add, a small tweak to the algorithm. Right now, the algorithm assumes that everyone has all the content, which is true for a gateway, because even if the gateway doesn't have the block, it's going to fetch it for you. Um, the, so I need to, to, to add uh, something like this, where it's able to remember, oh, this field doesn't have that block, I'll, I won't ask for it. And so that's all. Thanks so much. Up next, we have Magic from Lotus. So like, why is Filecoin so hard to use? And also why it's so hard to scale things like S3? Um, I think I was thinking more about the scaling aspect than the UX aspect. Um, and I was thinking about it for a while. And eventually, I had a whole like, string of ideas and came up with, came up with this special fancy blockster that in free should both scale and it should also provide really good, really nice UX. Um, so I would like quickly recap how storage in the IPFS and the Falcon universe works. Uh, so in IPFS, when you add a file, uh, you chunk it into some big size pieces, usually by default it's 256 kilobytes. Uh, then you get those chunks into what we call DAC protobuf, which is just a glorified protobuf that can link to other protobuf, protobufs using CIDs. Um, and when you construct the protobuf, we hash it, we put this hash into a multi-hash, just a fancy way to express hashes with different algorithms. Uh, and then we put the multi-hash into a CD, which is a way to express a link to data with some like certain encoding. Um, and this makes it possible to then know how to interpret that data to like further traverse the tag or the tag specific graph. Um, but by default, all the links are um, linking to DAC protobuf sets. Um, and so for a file, it's just a nice by default balanced tree of DAC protobufs. Um, for directories, um, we just get a, another like DAC protobuf object per directory. Uh, and as the directory is really large, you get hands, but it doesn't really matter here. Um, and then we put those objects into what we call a block store, which is just a glorified value store for like mapping sets to the actual block data. We can also put those DACs into what we call car files, which is just a way to store an IPLD graph uh, or a DAC on disk in a file. Um, that's important because Falcon uses those car files a lot. Um, so search in Falcon, um, you have the Falcon chain and it's run by storage providers. Um, each storage provider is essentially just storing a set of sectors and a sector is just a, uh, on mainnet either 32 or 64 gigabyte block of data. Um, and you can then like as a client store what we call deals with miners and deals are just pieces of like power of two sized pieces of data that then like are stored within a sector and they can be smaller than the sector. Um, it cannot be too small because that's very expensive. Um, so you kind of have to make your deals like probably at least four gigabytes in size for them to make economic sense. Uh, and they cannot be too big because we cannot really split deals across sectors yet. You kind of need to worry about the size. Um, that is really annoying. File is just the right size. That's actually fine. You just create a car file from your file and you 
make a deal with some service providers. Uh, but even files are too small, you need to gather a set of files and put them into like one car file that's an aggregate. And then you might need to worry about the sizing and so on. Uh, similar with if your file is too big, uh, you need to either split your file up before creating the IPFS DAGs, uh, or you need to split the IPFS or IPLD DAG after you've created the file, which is also not really that easy or cheap to do. Um, so yeah, aggregating data is kind of hard. Uh, you cannot really easily tell what size some DAG will have just by looking at the root node of it. Um, you need to traverse the whole DAG. Um, then there are like some caveats. So uh, multiple different DAGs that you are aggregating can share blocks. And that makes the sizing really, really annoying because um, you don't really know beforehand what DAGs you're going to be aggregating. You, you may be dealing with graphs that are just like a lot of small blocks um, that are very expensive to traverse, like really deep. Um, and so you need to like really think about how you structure code in a way that it actually works. Um, then splitting data is also not easy. Uh, we have many, many, many blocks kind of run into similar problems like with aggregation. Uh, just you happen to have more data. Um, and yeah, like just going through really large graphs is just hard and painful and slow. Uh, and another problem with the current way of doing things is that usually uh, when you create a car file, you probably are doing that from a block store. Um, no, block store is just a KV store usually. Um, and each time you create a car file, you're doing like tens of thousands to millions of reads per car file, um, depending on how big your IPLD blocks are on average. And that is very expensive, um, especially if you want to do like multiple replicas of your files and they can do that a lot and scale it up. Like doing millions of reads probably per second is not easy. I was like thinking, can we solve all of those problems all at once? Um, seems maybe hard, uh, but like, what if there was a way so that like we didn't have to deal with splitting this data? We didn't have to deal with aggregating it. Uh, like didn't have to deal with block store load when you try to build those car files for deals. Um, or like didn't even have to worry about having the DAGs be traversable um, and still somehow be able to retrieve this data after deals are made. That's with perhaps sync or bit swap. Apparently all the indexes at all layers um, really only care about multi-hashes, not zips. Uh, and there is just like one very, very special IPLD codec that is called raw. And as each are just raw bytes, uh, the raw blocks cannot have links. So what if we just pretend that all the blocks that we are storing are raw and just build some very, very light DAC on top of those raw blocks that we're storing that are not really raw. Um, like this, this light DAC just makes it possible to have the other parts of the Falcon like deal storage machinery work, uh, like the deal indexing and stuff. Uh, so that was the core idea behind RIPs and eventually just drive up this architecture. Um, so essentially like the core part is uh, like there is a top level index 
and those groups. Uh, groups are just, uh, like each group is just a bunch of, I feel deep blocks that are put into this block store. Uh, there is a set of groups that are currently being written to. And then there is just a bunch of groups that are laying around like full and being put on Filecoin probably. And groups can also be uploaded fully. So we're not storing them locally. They're just like somewhere stored with some storage providers. Um, each group is just deal size to put us somewhere between a couple of thousand to a couple of million blocks. Um, so it's small. Like it's kind of cheap to keep indexed locally, uh, but also big enough to manage all the higher level indexes very easily. Um, and then they're also very easy to scale. Um, like in the system, there's like a lot of weird looking decisions. Um, but really the aim is that it should be like fully scalable in a pretty much linear way. Um, so they started this Kubo node. And this is a normal Kubo node, but it brings two weird lines. It gives me a wallet and gives me a, another web interface. So if I go to this interface, it shows me a wallet, some balance, just like groups thing, and some uh, kind of piece. Uh, so now I can like try to just use this Kubo node as Kubo. Uh, so let's say I want to add some like Arch Linux mirror to it. And it's doing some things, just adding it. Right, take a second or two. The speed is mostly bottleneck by my disk speed. Could probably be somewhat faster uh, just because some indexes are not very optimized or not optimized at all currently. Um, but it creates some groups that build some virtual overlay R file on top of it, computes compi. Uh, it, does it best to make Falcon deals with it? Um, like really nice because I really just typed in two commands and sent one field to some address and it just string data on Falcon. Um, I think it's kind of cool. And so, yeah, like essentially what's happening here is when I do IPFS add, I have like a special Kubo node that is running a plugin that is injecting this RIPS blockster instead of the default Kubo blockster. Um, and so all the writes and also all the reads are we're directed to this rips box store. I can at least make mad attempts at being the content do like the object stat and things can see some cats happen. Uh, when I do that, then it's just a block store really. Uh, but it happens to store data in a manner that's really efficient for making Falcon deals and also happens to make Falcon deals. Um, and also at least on paper should scale really well. Um, that part I didn't test and I'm pretty sure that it needs a lot of work to scale. Um, but there's some potential. Um, so yeah, uh, that's my weekend project, I guess. Awesome. Thank you so much. We can move on to Yolen. So I'm going to be presenting you the new Jiren v1.5 uh, features. 
So these have not yet hit mainnet for DRUN, but they are being tested on testnet. So maybe a quick reminder, DRUN stands for Distributed Randomness, and it is an open source uh, software we've been developing just like um, you know, Lotus and other open source software we're developing. And DRUN is used by the legal philanthropy to run a free public randomness service so that anybody can query uh, public verifiable randomness from the legal philanthropy network running the run. And so just like you know, you have DNS servers, NTP servers, uh, certificate transparency logs, and so on, uh, you have the run that can provide um, yeah, random beacons. And um, the nice thing about DRUN is that it's fully decentralized. So you only need a threshold of nodes to be working as intended for it to work uh, yeah, properly and for the whole um, randomness to be safe and unpredictable as well as bias resistant. And the very nice thing as well is that it's very stable. So you can take the DRUN beacons and there is a very easy way of verifying them by just checking a BLS signature against a given public key for the legal philanthropy. And if that signature verifies, you can be sure that beacon is valid and has been properly generated by the legal philanthropy working together with a threshold of nodes um, collaborating to produce it. And so that is, yeah, a few nice properties. And uh, as I said, it's open source, written in Go, and it's using a lot of fancy uh, cryptography behind the hood, such as verifiable secret sharing, distributed key generation. Um, but a pretty important thing here is that it's based on BLS signatures, which stands for Benelin Chacham uh, signatures. And more precisely, these BLS signatures are instantiated on the BLS 12.381. Uh, elliptic curve, which is a pairing friendly curve. And um, that is quite important for what comes next um, because BLS 12381 is an elliptic curve where you have two groups and a pairing operation from these two groups, G1 and G2, onto a target group GT. And an important thing about these groups is that uh, group G1 is a regular group uh, of size 381 bits. But G2 uh, is a bit bigger. It's, um, it's an extension field of uh, dimension two. And so it has two coordinates uh, of size 381 bits. And GT is even much bigger. It's uh, the 12th uh, extension field of G1. So it's like 12 coordinates. But this is not too important because we're never storing GT values. We're always storing G1 or G2 values. And currently, DRUN works by having its public key on G1. So it means the public key for the group is 48 bit bytes. And um, signatures for each beacon are on G2. So each signature is 96 bytes. But there is actually no good reason for it to be like that. And um, that just means we have pretty big signatures and small public keys. And usually people do that because they have a lot of transactions being signed by many public keys and they want to include them in the block, you know? Um, and you can aggregate all signatures into a single signature pretty easily with BLS. But you cannot do so with the, well, you don't want to do so with the public keys because you want to know which address corresponds to which transaction and you, you need it to do verification, basically. So what people usually do is that they have short, uh, short public keys and big signatures because at the end of the day, they will aggregate all the signatures into a single one. But that is not how DRUN works. Uh, each beacon has its own signature and we never aggregate signatures in DRUN. So for DRUN, it would make more sense to have a big public key, just one, and then a lot of small signatures for each beacon. And this is exactly what we've done. So here is the anatomy of a DRUN beacon as it was previously. So the signature on G2 is encoded as a compressed point in hexadecimal. So it's taking 192 bytes, which is pretty big. And 
it even sometimes uh, was storing the previous signature, which is also 192 bytes. And then we also have the randomness value, which could be derived from the signature. So in theory, we could just give the run number and the signature, and that should be enough for anybody to verify a DRAN beacon and use the DRAN beacon to produce the randomness they need. Uh, so that was how it looked previously. And um, now with our new scheme using G1 for signatures, everything is much more compact because now uh, we have the signatures which are only taking 48 bytes, which encoded in X is only 96 bytes. And that is much nicer uh, for our HTTP relays because it's taking less bandwidth to transmit to the clients. And it's also much nicer to store. And this means we could save at least 37% of space and bandwidth just by switching to a new scheme using G1 for signatures and G2 for public keys. Um, but, you know, we didn't just stop there. And so, um, because using swapped groups also has other um, signification for many people that will be very interesting. Um, it is that the, the fact of verifying a BLS signatures, a BLS signatures on G2 is quite expensive. Uh, as you can see here, I have the gas cost uh, as estimated if it was running on Ethereum. Um, the gas costs of verifying a signature on G2 would be roughly 226,000 gas. And now with the swap groups, since G1 uh, signatures are much smaller, they are faster to verify on Ethereum and on any blockchain that is supporting BLS actually. And so now it would only cost like uh, 156,000 gas roughly. Um, these are estimates because Ethereum hasn't shipped native BLS support yet. So it's, you know, um, take a grain of salt there um, anyway. We also didn't stop there because um, we noticed, well, we want to launch a new network for DRAN to use this new signature scheme, you know? Um, but if we were to launch a new network, we thought we could do more things. Um, one feedback we had from DRAN users was that 30 seconds is long. And while Filecoin uh, block time is exactly 30 seconds and it's fine for most Filecoin users, people who are running applications that need randomness that is verifiable in a more frequent manner were a bit constrained by the 30 seconds frequency of the DRAN network. Like if you are, I don't know, a casino, you might want to be able to run a new draw every three or five seconds. And so we are planning on increasing the frequency of the new mainnet network to five or three seconds. Uh, and that increased frequency would mean we would need to store maybe 10 times more beacons. And so we looked at how we were storing beacons and we realized it was not very efficient because we were storing them just like we were serving them on the HTTP relays. That means we were storing them in hexadecimal encoding, which is twice the size of you know, plain binary encoding. And we were also including the previous signature in each beacon. But that previous signature is actually already stored since it's just the previous beacon's signature. So you could just query the previous beacon and you would get that previous signature. So we are currently storing signatures twice. And that is not great because it's, yeah, storage we don't need to waste. And everything was being stored in a bold DB file. And bold DB is a plain key value database written in Go. And everything is, is stored in a single file. And one thing we noticed is that bold DB does not support charting. And it's pretty slow when you have a big file. Like if you have a database that is waiting a few gigabytes, you are talking about hundreds or even hundreds of milliseconds or even seconds. Um, to perform one get or put operation. And that is pretty slow. And the bigger the database, the slower it gets. And we also had people asking us if they could store maybe the beacons in a MySQL or PostgreSQL database. And so we decided to rewamp our wall storage backends for DRAN. And so we optimized the existing bold DB backend. Um, we, we are now using binary representation for the signatures. So that is as compact as it's possible. And we are also, uh, we've 
tweaked our bold DB settings to use a field percent of 100%, because bold DB is a B3, is using a B3 implementation. And basically, since DRN is only appending new data at the end, we never need to put them in the middle of the database. So we can just fill the database as compactly as we want. And, and that has allowed us to get a very nice, um, uh, like, like a very nice uh, performance uh, increase. So currently storing or getting data from our Bolt DB backend is almost a hundred times faster, uh, which is great. Uh, we're talking about the tens of milliseconds now instead of hundreds or even seconds. And also it allowed us to significantly shrink the existing database size by a factor of almost five. Um, going under a gigabyte for all the past data that has been storing for the past two and a half year. And then we also, since we were working on storage, we thought we could just, you know, add a few new backends. And that's what we did. So we added a PostgreSQL backend, which allows a node to connect to a PostgreSQL database and store the beacons there. So they don't need to care about backups and data integrity. It's the, database administrator that need to care about that. And also we added an in-memory backend because at the end of the day, we want as many partners to participate in the legal entropy. And we don't want the partners to leave the legal entropy because it's taking too much disk or whatsoever. The most important thing being that the, we have a lot of people that are participating to the threshold network to increase the, the trust we can put in that threshold network because it, the idea behind DRAN's threshold network is that you trust that there is never a threshold amount of malicious nodes. And also you trust that the current members are not corrupt. And so the more members we have, if you can see a couple of people you know in, in there, you know, it increases the trust people would put in the system. And so that is a win for us. And so the in-memory backends allows you to skip storing beacons to disk and you would just or maybe the 1,000 or 2,000 last beacons, which are anyway the ones people are most interested in using, you know, and the ones that are getting uh, queried from the, the relays most often. And um, that's it. That's what we are launching in DRUN v1.5. Um, the League of Entropy is actually going to be launching a new mainnet network using the new cryptographic scheme, as well as the new uh, backend uh, the new storage backends in March, on the 1st of March. And this is very cool because it will enable us to do time lock encryption on the run mainnet, which is a super excited feature we're very um, excited about, yeah, and that we are hoping to bring to FVM and to, uh, yeah, um, like to have more people using time lock encryption very soon. And finally, yeah, uh, you can check the blog if you want to learn more about it. We will be publishing blog posts about the new cryptographic scheme, the storage backend, time lock, and so on in the upcoming weeks. And if you want a quick demo, I can show you the testnet uh, implementation. So currently, uh, I told you we launched on testnet. So we have the HTTP relay here. You can see we have three uh, chains. And if I go to the old chain, we can see it's a Pedersen BLS chain the scheme. And so it's um, if if we look at the um, at the beacons as I look, we can look at the latest beacon. We can see we have a short, relatively short randomness encoded as X, and then we have a pretty big signature as well as a pretty big previous signature. And if we look at the new network, it's using the BLS Unchained on G1 uh, scheme instead. So it has a much bigger public key compared to the uh, old network, if we compare them. Um, but instead, if we go to the, if we go to the um, latest signature, the, the latest beacon, we can see now we are not providing the previous signature because this is an unchained scheme. So we don't need the previous signature to verify the beacons. And the signature is also much smaller. Um, that's it, I guess, for my demo. Um, 
Thank you for watching. If you are in Tokyo uh, next month for Real World Crypto, a quick shout out. We are organizing a randomness summit. So if you attend Real World Crypto, don't hesitate to check out the randomness summit link. It's a free event. It will be in the same venue as Real World Crypto. And yeah, I'm looking forward to questions or seeing user if. Thanks, Yolan. Loved all that uh, new updates. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for attending Mother of All Demo Days. And thank you to all of our presenters. Appreciate it. Um, if you're interested in demoing, our next demo day will be March 16th. Have a great rest of your day. And if you have any questions, you know where to find all the presenters. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye.